Lord God and look into your word. We pray, Lord God, that whatever it is that you would have us glean from this, each of us would receive that which is appropriated to us by your wisdom, by your love, by your care, by your watchful eye. Jesus, we love you. And we smile with you because there's something going on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys. Thank you for worship. Thank you for nurturing and just uh, stewarding the presence of God and, and thank you family of God thank you flame tree that you are that you're keen uh, to be with us this morning thank you that you're keen for the things of God and um, boy who'd ever thought we'd be in this condition still now but here we are and there's a sense I guess that we're coming to a we're coming perhaps to a climax. It's sent, the, the idea, that the feeling I get in the spirit, of we're coming to a birthing. We're coming to, to a, a moment uh, from which we can, we can believe that we're going to be moving into a new era, a new, a new reality. And uh, it goes without saying that today is uh, the Sunday wherein we, we celebrate Pentecost. Uh, according to the Hebrew calendar, it was Friday, Thursday night and Friday was Shavuot, that the Feast of Weeks, and, um, and we come to our final chapter of Ruth today that uh, would have actually taken place on the Feast of Shavuot, on the Feast of Pentecost. And I'll give you my reasoning for that as we go. But it's just a few uh, reminders about the, the beauty and the symmetry of this, beauty, this story and, and the season that we find ourselves in. Ruth takes place uh, between Passover and and Pentecost. The whole story takes place within those 50 days, uh, the majority of the drama that we find in this book, and it climaxes on Pentecost. And uh, today being Pentecost, uh, that, that weekend of Shavuot Pentecost that we're marking right now, and most of us as believers, we, we reckon, we, we, we remember Acts chapter 2 and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place on that day as a fulfillment of the promise that was um, that is associated with this feast for, for centuries before. But it, I, I just want to fill you with a sense of the wonder of the season that we're, we are in and that the, the feasts of the Lord, although they're outlined for us in Leviticus t uh, chapter 23, I want to remind you again that they are more than just Jewish feasts. They are, in fact, the feasts of the Lord, the seasons prescribed by God for his uh, redemptive acts in history. And the reason uh, I would say that is because long before the book of Leviticus was written, the feasts of the Lord, these seasons were in the heart of God. And the evidence of that, for instance, we find already way back in the, in the time of Noah. And, uh, and so you see, if you read carefully, you see that the ark rested on Mount Ararat in the season of Passover. And the ark, or, or before the season of Passover, but the ark the, the covering of the ark was taken off. Uh, a wind blew across the surface of the water and the water began to reside or, or, reside, or uh, recede. That's what I'm looking for. And uh, Moses, or Noah was invited out of the ark along with all the occupants of the ark and came out and offered up a free will sacrifice during the season or on the day of Pentecost. And so we see these themes of redemptive satisfaction of sealing of culmination uh, the wind blowing a, a wedding taking place all on the season of passover and so we move further on and as you well know um, uh, pentecost is the season when israel comes to the mountain of god and uh, and god there bequeaths to israel this book this revelation of who he is but he does it in the context of a wedding it is so beautiful that God comes down to the mountain in fire and smoke and there weds Israel to himself as a bride. And from that, Israel draws all of the, the, uh, the illusions in a Jewish wedding feast are taken from that encounter with God at Mount Sinai. And um, the, the idea of Pentecost is, uh, is something I want, I want to get into your spirit because without, without Pentecost, Passover becomes pointless. You can't. If God had, uh, if God had allowed the the ark to to rest on the mountains, uh, but had done nothing further uh, in taking mankind into His purposes, it would have been pointless. It would have been beautiful, but pointless. If God had rescued Israel from Egypt 
uh, from being slaves in Egypt and brought them miraculously out with all signs and wonders, but not brought them to the mountain and married them and committed himself in covenant again afresh to them, it would have been powerful but pointless because without that relationship with God, freedom would have quickly dissolved into chaos and further slavery. And, uh, and so too, um, without the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' death on the cross that we celebrated a few weeks ago and we remembered the great cost of our salvation, that would have been an heroic, loving act. But without the gift of the Holy Spirit, it would have been pointless. And without the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, the whole thing, uh, or, or without the death of Jesus, the, the gift of the Spirit would have been impossible. And so too, we see these two feasts bound inseparably together. And so they are in the book of Ruth, that without um, the marriage that takes place in chapter four of Ruth, all of the other drama of the story, Ruth's uh, heroic commitment to Naomi and her coming and finding at least some reprieve in gleaning in the fields of Boaz, without the marriage, it would have been a nice story, but there'd been no, no point to it because there's no, there's no strength that derives from it. No identity is bequeathed to Ruth as a consequence of her marriage to Boaz. And so this day of Shavuot, this day of Pentecost becomes for us a day of, of uh, the bequeathing of identity. It is the strengthening of the Holy Spirit that comes. It's the blowing of, of the wind that causes the, the waters of our life to recede and the landscape to become clear again. All of these themes are wrapped up in this amazing day and in this amazing story. I've said and I've reminded you that Pentecost speaks of a, a wedding feast that is illustrated too with the gift of the Holy Spirit that is the promise of God to us. <clears throat> it is a wedding gift. It is, the, it is the empowering that we should become like him. And in any marriage, the, the partners in a marriage covenant must become like one another, complementary to one another. They cannot be in contradiction or in competition. And so the gift of the Holy Spirit that we celebrate on Pentecost and Shavuot is the, is the power to become like our bridegroom, to become appropriate to our bridegroom. Without that power, the whole story falls over and becomes loving and astonishing and unprecedented, but pointless. So this day is an amazing day too. And so this chapter four of Ruth becomes an amazing chapter for us. For without it, the whole story becomes really just a nice story and uh, with, with no real happy ending that we can see. It is chapter four that gives us the ending that must be found to satisfy our hearts, the, the longing of our spirits for that, if you will, the happy ending of every fairy tale that humanity has written. Those are echoes of the eternity God has placed in the hearts of mankind for all generations. Whether they acknowledge God as the living God or not, never mind, it's in their DNA. God has placed eternity there. And out of that heart cry come all the tales of men, all the fairy tales, all the happy endings, all the longing for more, all the, 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 the beautiful wedding at the end of the, of the fairy tale. Um, but the, it's more than a fairy tale. It's not made up uh, from mankind. We're drawing on a memory of the seed that God has placed into humanity to, that drives us, that, cause, that longing causes us to move toward the hint of a promise. And it's only in Christ Jesus, only in the beautiful bridegroom that we find the satisfaction of that longing, yeah? And so we see Jesus pictured in the person of Boaz and we see the Gentiles again represented in the, in the, in the person of Ruth who becomes the friend according to her name of Naomi, the Jewish people. We see all, there's so many layers to this story. And uh, for those of you in the Flame Tree family, you've received the notes for chapter four. And so I'm gonna leave you to unpack those notes. And this morning, I just want to emphasize really just a few themes. And, and I've already begun with one of them, and that is the marriage. I don't want to take you. Do you remember last week in chapter three, we talked about the fact that um, Boaz um, applauded Ruth for seeking, um, to, to, to finding refuge with the God of Israel and coming to come under his wing. And then when she comes to the threshing floor, 
um, she lays at Boaz's feet and invites him to place the wing of his garment over her. The, these are wedding symbols, guys, if you hadn't seen them before. Let me just take you just briefly before we get into, into Ruth <clears throat> to Ezekiel 16. Beautiful language that we find here in verse 8 where the Lord says of Israel, <clears throat> I passed by and saw you and behold, you were at the time for love. And I spread my skirt, it's the same Hebrew word, I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I also put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet and I wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your hands and a necklace around your neck. I also put a ring into your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. And thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. This is the picture of a wedding. This is, a, this is the bride adorned for her wedding. But who adorns her? Does she get herself ready? No. The Lord pulls her up out of her absolute need her abject need and he is the one that washes and adorns and beautifies and bedecks her with value and ascribes to her royalty yeah he's the one that does that and that is precisely what god is doing in this season it is another step in our journey of surrendering to his love and allowing him to do what only he can do. Only God can make his bride beautiful. Only God can wash us satisfactorily and make us appropriate for his son. Only God can do that. And it begins with the infilling of his spirit to those who have surrendered to his love and declared Jesus to be the Lord of their life. And there may be some of you watching again this morning who have yet to do that who have yet to surrender to the love of God, who made you, who knows you inside and out more than and better than you do yourself, who knows what will satisfy you, who knows how to fulfill your deepest longing, who knows how to surround you with protection and provision and the love that you long for. All it requires you to do is on this day of days, this amazing season brought about in the divine purposes of God, in wisdom that was birthed from before the earth was created, to surrender to his love and say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Let me turn from my ways and turn to your ways. Show me how to live, Jesus. And I wonder if there are some of you, as I continue, where that is not the echo in your heart. Hey, and you just allow the Lord to minister to you, to come alongside you, to fill you up, to confirm to you that he is in fact in love with you there's no track record whether old or new whether whether ancient or recent that can disqualify you from the love of god if you will pause now and surrender to that love and say lord be my lord jesus be my savior wash me of my sin fill me with your spirit mark me with your name and let me be born again. Whew, God is so good. God is so good. And so we come uh, again in chapter 3. Um, the exhortation for Ruth was to go down to the threshing floor. And let me just remind you of some of these themes again. At the threshing floor, the threshing floor works because there is a wind. Where the, the grain can be winnowed. And then the remaining can be threshed or driven under the, the threshing sledge and, and, and producing that, that, that useful grain product. At, uh, at in, in the days of Noah, God brought the story to a climax with a wind that blew to cause the waters to recede. In the in encounter with Israel at Mount Sinai, when God married Israel to himself for all time, God came in fire and smoke. And a mighty wind yeah that's why elijah went to the mountain of god and was was looking for it and he discovered the lord in a still quiet voice yeah blowing gently like a zephyr um, god comes in these in these uh in these uh, encounters 
And so now <clears throat> Ruth comes in chapter four. And this chapter is all about the initiative of Boaz. Ruth has done everything that she can do according to the laws of Israel, according to the advice given to her by Naomi. She's come and presented herself. She's invited Boaz to spread the garment, the wing of his garment over him. She, in other words, has said, let me, will you marry me according to the laws, your laws of Israel? And Boaz um, doesn't reject, but he, he accedes to the request and says, I will not rest until this is settled. And so chapter four is all about Boaz, his initiative. Um, and so he goes, um, he, he is where he goes to bat. And so in verse one, Boaz went to, to the gate and sat down there and behold, a close relative whom Boaz spoke, um, of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. That, that kinsman redeemer who had the right of redemption before Boaz was passing by the gate. We have some interesting language here because he now says, he says, turn aside friend in my English translation, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down and Boaz took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And so they sat down and Boaz presents the case to them. But just, and you can read the case for yourself and you know the story um, and you have notes, but I just want to point out some things that some of us might not see. First of all, uh, he says, turn aside friend. Uh, that word is a, is a stretch in terms of translation because in the Hebrew, we don't find the word friend. We find some uh, uh, words of anonymity. We find uh, the Hebrew words are uh, poloni almoni. It almost sounds uh, mocking. Um, and they are two words put together that, that give us the idea of, of, of such and such or so and so. In other words, turn, turn aside so and so whatever your name is. In other words, what I want to point out to you, do you remember um, when, I, when I began this study, um, in chapter one and two, we have name in Hebrew. The, the, language, the, the word name is used seven times. And in this final chapter, the same word name, Shem, is used seven times. Um, the name, identity is so important in this book. And remember, Ruth came, first of all, as Ruth the Moabitess from Moab. Again and again, we heard that, you know, as, as if we, we were reminding her of her, of her position in, in, in opposition to the people of God, outside the privilege of having a relationship with God. She's a Moabite who can't even come to the assembly of God by the law of God. And then we have this great miracle where she's invited in. She breaks in through with courage and with faith. And she's received and she's embraced and, the, and Boaz puts the, his garment over her and acknowledges her as someone who can come into the covering of Israel. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. But here we have this kinsman redeemer who remains nameless, which is very ironic because as the story unfolds, Boaz, as you know, says, you have the right of redemption so you can take Elimelech's land and uh, it will become yours, right? And he says, I'll do it, no problem. But then Boaz says, oh, but you also get Ruth in the bargain. You have to marry Ruth and you have to bear children through Ruth who will become children of, of um, uh, uh, a Ruth's family and not your own. And so all of a sudden he says, wait a second. Oh, that means um, I'm gonna have to subdivide my inheritance even further through children born to Ruth for Ruth's family and Naomi's family. And he's thinking to himself and scratching his head, thinking that's going to reduce my, my inheritance for my own children. It threatens my own value. It threatens my own name. And so with an eye to preserving his name, he refuses the offer of kinsman redeemer, thinking he thereby preserves his name, but he comes down to us as a nameless one. He is just so-and-so who, um, uh, who, who uh, uh, gave away that opportunity. It's very interesting. And um, we find uh, examples of that in scripture too. I met, the story that came to me as I was looking at this once again was the story of, of um, the Tower of Babel or Babel. And you remember that when they're about to build the Tower of Babel, they use this language. Let us build a tower to heaven that touches heaven and make a name for ourselves. And that's when God responds and said, you're not going to do that because of the danger of pride. 
And so God comes down and confuses the language. And so rather than making a name for themselves, they are scattered to the four corners of the earth. And the nations, if you will, of the earth are born at that time. Yeah. And it's only a few chapters later in Genesis. In fact, uh, the next chapter, chapter 12, is where God says to Abraham, by virtue of your surrender, I will make your name great. There's a big difference here. Um, when we seek to make our own name, our own way, our own reputation, we'll lose it all. When we surrender to God, the love of God, the purposes of God in the Savior Jesus, then all of a sudden our name is, is marked, it is remembered, it is elevated. We become part, part of the family of God. And didn't Jesus say in Matthew, he says, those that seek their life will lose it and those that lose their life for my sake will find it. And so we see that beautiful example here again, where this one who would preserve his name actually loses it and comes to us as a so-and-so, as a such-and-such, -such, as a nameless one. Yeah. And so yielding his right, Boaz lays hold of it, and he does it in front of 10 elders of the city. 10 is the number of judgment, of consideration, of justice. And uh, so it's done legally. And... Uh, Boaz then they have this uh, uh, interaction where the, the the kinsman the earlier kinsman redeemer removes his shoe as a way of remembering the moment he gives his sandal in, in token to Boaz relinquishing his right to the land of Elimelech and uh, Ruth um, as a as a wife and so now um, Boaz takes hold of this inheritance and um, Verse 10, he says, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Machlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah, another name for Bethlehem, and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, uh, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. There's so much going on in those few verses, but let me just point out um, this beautiful reality. At the end of the book, Ruth, who is introdu introduced to us as uh, Ruth the Moabitess, who came from Moab, is now blessed as Ruth, who n not the Moabite, but Ruth who will become like Rachel and Leah, the, the, uh, the matriarchs of the nation of Israel. She is fully embraced. She is seen as a, as a full member of the house. She's no longer outside, far off in the dark. And in Ephesians 2, we read that Jesus, by his blood, he's taken Jew and Gentile and has made them into one new man. They're no longer separated, but they are in the same house, the same family. They are embraced by the same love of God. They are, they are um, uh, dependent on the same root, according to Romans 11. This is, this is the glorious strategy of God, that if in, in Genesis 11... The nations were created through their own foolishness and pride and scattered to the four corners. Now at the end of redemptive history, Jesus is going to embrace all nations and draw them to himself to be one family with one father, one bride, with one bridegroom, all equally satisfied with the love of God. Yeah, it's so beautifully um, illustrated here in this profound story. Yeah. And so it says in verse 13, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and she bore a son to him. And uh, the women said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today and may his name become famous in Israel. Verse 15, may he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him and they named him Oved. And Oved became the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of David, who is the forebear of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. It's a glorious, glorious story. Yeah? 
And the language here is, is fascinating. The, the women around at the birth uh, declare that Na God has given Naomi a son. So she who went out full, remember chapter 1, and declares, I've come back empty, now is not only satisfied with more grain than she can eat, remember, remember the middle two chapters, but now in this story, at the end of the chapter, uh, she's declared to have given, she's been given a son herself. Having lost her two sons, now this son of Ruth is not just a grandson to Naomi, but considered to be a very son to Naomi. And Obed is a beautiful name. Obed, Oved, uh, comes from a word in Hebrew that means to worship. It actually also comes from the same root that gives us the word to work. And so we see that the work of God is in fact worship. And as we continue to worship God, the purpose and strategy of God continues to unfold in our lives. And not just in our personal lives, but in the redemptive strategy of God for all mankind that is flowing towards a prescribed climax. I hesitate to say the word end because it's not an end at all. In fact, the end of the age, it may be the end of time, but it becomes the beginning of God's um, uh, more uh, greater purpose for humanity. It's not just a uh, uh, a winding down, uh, sitting in clouds and playing harps for eternity. It is everything that God has planned uh, from before time uh, for his, the, the object of his heart. That is to say, um, the, his, the bride for his son. And that beautiful relationship is really only going to begin um, when time ends and eternity unfolds in front of us. When the Savior presents his bride uh, before that which he has prepared for her that is inconceivable to you and I, yeah? This is what Jesus has done. And let me just also mention as we come to a close here, this blessing in verse 15 echoes um, a, a very famous blessing in, in the Jewish liturgy that is familiar to many of you at Flame Tree because we use it a lot. But listen to the sentiments in the blessing in verse 15. May Obed, yeah, may your son, also be to you a restorer of life, and a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. That's the season that she finds herself in, the season of fulfillment, the season of satisfaction. Those three themes, life, sustaining, and seasons, are found in the blessing of the Shehecheyanu, which it translates this way, um, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the, the universe, who has kept you alive and sustained you and brought you to this season. And uh, as, we, as we wrap up this morning, I, I want to I focus you guys on that, that this season that we are in is a season designed by God that we should pause and worship and accomplish the work of God as he takes us toward our wedding day. Yeah? He's kept you alive. For some of us, it's been a struggle. For some of us, it's been full of questions and uncertainty. But he's brought you seasons of great grace through it all. You're not just breathing. Yeah? He has sustained you with all that you need for life and godliness. And he's brought you to this season. Do not miss the season we are in. Yeah? Don't lower your gaze and just simply long for the, the removing of restrictions and life to return to as normal. There's so much going, more going on uh, than a return to normal. This is a season of God, um, ordained by God, purposed by God to prepare his bride for that day that is coming. And you know what's being read? In, uh, in the synagogue this weekend, this same weekend of Shavuot, um, is the passages in Numbers that bring us uh, to, a, to another blessing that is very familiar with you, with, uh, to you. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> this is the blessing of the Lord uh, upon all of us as we end in, Ro in Numbers chapter uh, 6. Um, and this is very interesting because it says in verse 23, the command of the Lord comes to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons saying, thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them. So the command is to bless Israel. 
and it comes down to us through faith in Yeshua, through faith in Jesus, this blessing comes to you. But the language in the blessing is not a, a um, it's, in Hebrew, it's not, it is not a um, plural. He's not blessing a nation this way. It is, it is singular. The blessing comes from God, God's command to bless each individual. It is a singular uh, language used in this blessing. So receive it to your heart this morning again. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.